things. I like to try to think about memory and divide it up into all the different kinds of memory that might exist and try to understand how that works and how that works in the brain. So I'm going to tell you about three different kinds of memory, okay, and then we'll go from there. There's actually loads and loads of... Most people tend to not really think about memory too much, as long as it's working, you know, and then when it stops working, people get a bit grumpy. But um, we think about it a lot. So, so one kind of memory, um, I'd like you to just try the following. Look around the room for a couple of seconds, and then close your eyes and pay attention to what happens. Now, most of you will probably have gotten just a, a very brief impression on the insides of your eyelids of what you were just looking at. And that kind of, that's a kind of memory. Um, we refer to it as sensory memory. Information is very unprocessed, so it's really just a, a visual impression of what you've just seen. So it's not, you know, it, you don't, it's not the kind of memory that you've sort of processed or thought about a lot. Okay? And the other thing that we think about sensory memory is that it's very high capacity. So that means there's actually lots and lots of information in there. Um, and we can store lots of information in our sensory memory. But because it leaves our memory so quickly, we don't realize how much is in there. And if you ask people to, like, if you show them a, a bunch of letters on a screen, for example, and you ask them to tell you what letters they've seen, they can usually, if you just flash it up for a millisecond to get that sensory memory, they can usually only report back about four of them. Okay? But if you show them that whole screen, and then after you've shown them that whole screen, you say, I just want you to tell me the third line of letters, you give them a cue, like a, a sound that tells them to report the third line, they can also remember four letters. Okay? So the idea is that all of those letters were probably in their sensory memory, but because they fade so quickly, um, you can only report back a few of them. So that's one kind of memory. Now another kind of memory that we um, talk about in psychology is something called short-term memory. Short-term memory lasts a bit longer than sensory memory, but not that long, so it might last for a couple of minutes. And this is probably not relevant to any of you guys, but I'm a bit older than most of you. So it's the kind of memory that you would use when you're trying to remember a phone number. Now, I know nobody actually tries to remember phone numbers these days, do they? Um, back in the days before mobile phones, um, you know, phone numbers, um, in, in Canada, phone numbers are seven digits long, and that's about the amount of information that you can retain in your short-term memory. And let me just give you an example, because there's some interesting things about short-term memory. So if you look at this list of letters here, okay, let me show that to you, look at them, and then close your eyes, do you think you can report those letters back to me in the correct order? No. 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 And that's because I've got 15 letters here, okay, so that's pretty tough. It's, it's, it's really tough to remember that kind of information for any, or to be able to report that kind of information back to me. If I show you oops, this list of letters, okay, close your eyes, do you think you could report those back to me in the yes. Yeah. So that's a fundamental property of short-term memory is that it depends on how that information is organized, okay? So we can remember about seven things. Seven plus or minus two is what we say in psychology, so about five to nine things in our short-term memory. But it's five to nine things, so it's not five to nine letters, it's five to nine chunks of information. And if I show you this, that's probably really easy to remember. And then the third kind of memory I want to tell you about is basically everything else. That's long-term memory, okay? So that's information that lasts a long time. Well, for on the order of several minutes, up to decades if you're old enough. There are many, many, many different types of long-term memory. So just to give you an example, um, there's a distinction between implicit and explicit memory. So explicit memory is the kind of memory that you're sort of consciously aware of. If you tried to remember what you had for breakfast this morning, for example, if you could put words onto it, if you could tell a story about it, that would be explicit memory. And then there's implicit memory. This is my son, by the way. Um, implicit memory, which is, which is memory that you have that you're not necessarily consciously aware of. So learning to ride a bicycle. The memory that you have when you know how to ride a bicycle, you might not be able to verbalize. If, you, you know, if you've ever tried to teach someone how to ride a bike, it's actually very difficult to tell them exactly what you do when you get on that bicycle. So it's not easily to put it, in, it's not easy to put it into words, but you get on that bike and you just know what to do. This is the um, first time um, that uh, me and um, Lisa work together um, 
and try to find a common language between the artistic and the scientific people. And it's kind of difficult, in a sense, but actually we found um, a common element of interest in dealing with <coughs> the idea of memory linked to perception. And um, that from the artistic viewpoint is really to do with uh, the moment of recollection, that to me is to do with the idea of um, uh, being present in the moment and uh, what recollection does to who we are as people and how it relates to our identity. I hope you all have brought a, an object with you. Have you? Or have you an object that you might want to talk uh, about in relationship to a memory or something? So, um, so the, okay, the, why do you think about that? I'm just going to go back to the Just saying that within an artistic context, what, um, what tends to happen is that generally artists um, use their memory quite a lot and they use it generally also <coughs> linked to imagination, so that long term memory is more sort of blends into other elements so it's less probably obvious and it's less explicit and it's just implicit in what they do. My um, way of, um, my interest in memory as I said is to do with uh, the presentness of recollection and also, which I didn't mention this morning, but the, um, the use of documentation of performance and live performance, so how um, video documentation shown live um, sort of uh, um, relates to how audience memorise the event, so how video relates to memory and things like that. Now, within the art context, um, and what came out earlier also is the, the, the and what I like to use is the, the term of um, uh, translation, uh, which means that when we remember something, we recollect from memory something, we um, adopt a method of some kind, we use instruments of different kinds to translate that um, memory into a different um, context through using media of various kinds. So if we make a drawing, then by drawing something um, that um, is to do with a particular memory, we make a choice of, of, um, of that particular shape or that particular something and we discard other possibilities. And then uh, when we talk about something that comes from memory again, we sort of make a choice of how we talk that particular thing, how we describe that particular thing, and we discard other possibilities. And so in that sense, um, again, for me, within the artistic context, the idea of um, erasure, erasure also within memory is, is very important. But what I would do now is I would um, start by asking you to maybe, um, who, who wants to start to, to, me, sorry, to um, uh, talk about um, a memory related to an object. And that obviously um, is to do with long-term memory. And this is something that sort of the participation and something like this would, um, is something that artists now use quite a lot with participatory work or, or site-specific work. So it's not only something that we can use to show how long-term memory works. It's also a, a way of um, involving audiences that artists work. Um. Um, I went to India recently to work for disadvantaged children and I bought this necklace so when I look at it it always reminds me of their faces and how lucky I am to be sitting here, a nice house, studying well at school and just reminds me of how unlucky they are and how much I want to help them. Mm. <laughs> so it brings you back to that yeah. place. Yeah. Another lovely example of episodic memory and using a particular item to take you back. Um, but also bringing that into your present, I mean what I like about what you just said is you're bringing that back in, in, into influencing your present yeah. state of mind, aren't you? So it's not just going back into that memory, but that memory is, is also affecting you yeah. in the present. Which sort of illustrates how fluid, you know, memory is much more fluid than people think think it is. People tend to think that you stick things in your brain and they stay there and they represent what actually happened and they don't change. But that's not actually true. Um, they're very subjective. Uh, everybody's had the experience of getting into an argument with someone and they say one thing, you say the other, and your memory of it, of what happened, is actually correct. And their memory, they think, is actually correct. Um, both are correct, actually, um, usually.
happen and how this distinction between what's happening in the present and what happened in the past isn't as clear cut as because we were saying earlier that in fact we can somehow change memories there is a, a reason of thinking that actually memories can be updated and changed that's right every time we recollect them and work on them that's so. right and that's something that's fairly new in, in, in the field uh, in my field is that we we have realized we thought that memories were static but we've realized that you, if you bring them into the present moment and do something with them you actually change them and that people have looked at post-traumatic stress disorder so sort of the idea of erasing very bad memories from our past and, it, and it's possible actually to do that <coughs> Yeah, that'd be good. This is a Japanese sword guard of about 18th century date. It was an article of a gentleman's dress and therefore ornamental. And this one is interesting because it displays two psychological points. Yes. Firstly, you see this thing here. What is it? Is it like a paw? It's a paw. Is that right? Yeah. So you turn it over to see what the rest of the animal looked like. Okay. Ah. Wow. Ah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And you see an old man with a tiger. Mm. Tiger's not attacking the old man. It looks sort of rather like a pet cat. And this illustrates a story. The old man is a Taoist immortal, a, 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 a hermit who lived in the hills, and legendary, of course. And the story goes that he found a tiger mm -hmm. and kept it as a pet. And in the course of time, the man and the tiger came to look alike. They both looked rather fierce. Oh, I had an uncle who um, commanded a gunboat on the Yangtze in the days when uh, it was an international waterway policed by the British. And at the end of his commission, he came home by way of Japan, somewhere about 1900-1902. And, and being of an artistical nature, he spent some of his accumulated back pay on Japanese art. And at that time, the Japanese nationalist spirit was at a low ebb. They were all for the European style. Mm. So these things were going at a reasonable price. Yeah. <laughs> Here we've seen episodic memory, but also semantic memory. So we've all learnt a little bit about it. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen a Japanese sword guard mm -hmm. before. Um, mm -hmm. or the history of that. So that's really interesting. To think Maybe we can, we, we can, if this anybody else who wants to talk about anything specific? I'm um, studying conversation and dialogue and I bought it because it, one, I need to faithfully record conversations with people but it really gets in the way when people know they're being recorded. So yes. sort of, mm. I both love and hate this thing, that's, yeah. that's why I bought it on. Mm. Yeah, but that's also an interesting... because it's an object that you kind of use but then it has, it's a, it stores it's an archival. Yeah. Um, it's something that makes that archives information, mm -hmm. and it's also that's the other element that for me it's very important about memory is to do with uh, in terms of um, um, how you work with memory in, a, in an artistic yeah. way is when um, memory becomes um, archived and the value of archives mm -hmm. and whether archives are um, to do with the past as much as memory in, in our way of understanding or whether archives, specifically digital archives, are actually to do with the present moment of, again, um, you know, when we retract that information, in, in, it's just like how I'm interested in uh, uh, retrieving information from our memory archive. I think that the, these digital devices for me are very interesting because mm -hmm. then um, when, for instance, in, a, in, a, in an installation or a video project, I work with uh, memory with, with audiences in the present, sometimes I use uh, material from archives. And I think that it's very interesting that um, even though you may use a uh, Video footage from I don't know the 30s or, or, or sometimes in you know the far past, and you 
and you use it and you make the audience aware of that particular footage, um, they read it in terms of their experience of the present. Mm -hmm. And so as much as we, you know, because we're used to the televisual image and how that is transmitted in the present moment, so, and then you see everything you want to see that comes from years ago or, or, or is live. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way, archived information loses its sense of past because yeah. of it, it makes sense in the very moment yeah, of the reception. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's always. And so that's why, I mean, I'm a bit obsessed with the idea of the present. I think that's really interesting from a psychological perspective because one thing that's really well established is that our memory is not actually very good. You know? <laughs> and everybody's experienced this when you've had, not that any of you have ever had a fight with quarrel with anyone, I'm sure, but you know, when you have your perspective on what happened, and they have their perspective, and you're certain that you're right, and they're certain that they're right, and you're wrong. obviously <laughs> they're wrong. Um, but we all, you know, we all bring our own interpretations. First of all, we bring our own interpretations onto situations, but it's also the case that our memories are not archives like these digital devices. Mm -hmm. they, they are notoriously bad, actually, and, and they can be influenced after the fact mm -hmm. by things, you know, so a lot of work has been done looking at eyewitness testimony and mm -hmm. planting questions and influencing people's memories through that. And, and um, So that's to do with this fluidity quality. And that's to do with this fluidity. So you think that you have this very static archive of information that's actually reliable, mm -hmm. but as it happens, first of all, it's not very static, and secondly, it's not very reliable. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can influence. Yeah, so one, one classic study looked at, um, they showed subjects a, a video of a car crash, so just a minor car crash, and then they asked different people about that car crash in different ways. So they, they asked them to estimate the speed of the car when it hit the signpost. And some people, they said, how, how fast was the car going when it bumped into the signpost? Others, they said, how fast was it going when it crashed into the signpost? Others, um, how fast was it going when it collided into the signpost? And people's estimates of the speed varied depending on the way the question was worded. Mm -hmm. So if it was just bumping into the signpost, they estimated a very slow speed. Mm -hmm. But if it collided with the mm -hmm. signpost, they estimated a much higher speed. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of result has been shown over and over again mm -hmm. in literature, um, showing mm -hmm. that our memories are not veridical and also that they um, are subject, highly subject to outside influence. Mm -hmm. What I will ask you to do is to, I'm just going to sit here as you're sitting down and then I'm just going to ask you to stand up later maybe. So if you could uh, follow what I do um, and do it one after the other. Can we do that? <coughs> yeah? So in a kind of a wave um, sort of way. Okay, so I'll start with you, sir, if that's all right. So I'll just do that. And you do it. And do I put the yeah. yeah, and your side. Oh, yeah. And then down, starting from there. Down, 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 down. And then we do everybody up. And then we do like that, just follow me. Okay, and down. Okay. Just follow me. I think I'd rather stay silent and you just follow what I do. That's okay. All together now. And back, starting from there, one at a time, and sitting down. Yes, two at a time. One at a time.
¿Sí? No la firmo. See, what I'm trying to do is I'm describing what you're doing. I'm not trying to have you to do something. But it's difficult. <laughs> it's my duty. Talking a bit. the way you want to react to what I say, okay? Okay, nodding. Moving your legs. Now I'm going to stop. Moving the legs a little bit. Moving down. Up. Smiling. What happened there? I was trying to describe what you were doing in the present, and probably, and you would see what happened there that I described. So it's trying to create a flow of time because that one is delayed by eight seconds. So let's try again. You can interact with me if you want. I'm just going to describe what you do. And if you look at back at your image, that might create a bit of either a confusion or I don't know. So, shall I do it with a gentleman? Sitting down still, moving the hands a little bit. Legs one neck to each other. Moving the fingers a little bit. Smiling. Looking up at the screen. Looking down at me. Okay. That's it. But what happened during the performance when I was doing this with people? Someone started to just move and do things really erratically and I couldn't um, it could keep up with the pace of movement they were doing in front of me. But I guess um, they had a different frame of mind. They just wanted to sort of, um, make fun of me or something. But it kind of worked in a sense so that yeah, it created a bit more of a contrast with what was happening in the present and what was happening there. All right, I think this is it for these. And now, the last thing I want to do would be for you to stand and follow me walking, okay? Just behind me. So if you stand up and just follow me, uh, we can, um, I think that's going to stay there, but you, I'm going to ask you to, to sort of focus on um, what we're doing as we walk, okay? So I'm just going to go like that. Maybe look down and see where we go. Mm. Okay.
So this, um, the, the sort of video delay is something that I've used quite a lot. Uh, my interest in the mirror image that maybe Lisa may sort of um, focus in more on the scientific viewpoint, but it, it needs to do when sort of kids start to recognize their own image in the mirror and what the kind of effect that that has um, uh, on, on kids' um, subjectivity and the sort of the self. Um, and then... And, uh, and then the fact that um, nowadays with the Wii and the Xbox and everything, we have this, I mean, some of us might have experienced this idea of being able to manipulate what happens in front of you, which is not something you can do in real life, actually. So when you see your mirror image in a mirror or even video your own real life experience, um, you can look back at it and that creates a little bit of a... Um, um, but um, a bit of a deja vu, as in you sort of um, you just see yourself doing something a little bit before, and um, and you're not able to change that. But you might find it a bit difficult to recognise maybe how you um, gesticulate, maybe you move your head in a way that you didn't realise you do, or things like that, and. Um, and that is to do with, again, sensory memory a bit. So there's a, a small time lap um, from the time you've done something and the time you actually see yourself having done it. And, um, and that, to me, as an artist, is a very interesting um, um, tool to use for video performances and things like that. And then um, what to do now is simply to record something from a very recent experience that you've done, so it's sort of memory, uh, this is short-time memory, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little bit longer than this, but it's short-time memory, but also in, um, uh, in art, there's a, um, when you train to be an artist and you draw, there's a, an exercise that is called an aritentivo, or bioretention, that is not really drawing from memory, because it's to do with a um, with observing something or, or being in the moment with your head when you do something and then draw from that experience after a few minutes. So, um, whereas drawing from memory is really to do about drawing from your long-term memory kind of um, archive and, and sometimes that gets mixed up with imagination so it's a little bit different whereas when you draw better attention like this and you do it on purpose you, you actually do it after a very short period of time of a particular experience so it comes out in a different way it's not more objective it's just it's it's less processed it's a representation isn't it a representation yes. of what yes. you just experienced yes. which is what our brains do and that's yeah. what you know our memories are is a representation in our brains of something that we just experienced and it's interesting to see that everybody has a slightly different yeah. representation but even then when you draw how do you think about it in, in, because what you're saying yes we have a representation so it's like a second step away from right. the original experience isn't it yes. in a sense because yeah, the representation in the brain is obviously not a little drawing it's no. a pattern of firing in the cells in our brain yeah. um, so it's very different yeah. yeah and also yes and also thinking about this so if we can call it probably yes second step away which is um also i think what i'm really i'm really happy about thinking um in in relation to memory is uh, thinking about erasure. Mm. <laughs> I know that you like that, maybe. I don't know. But oh, I mean, yes, the, yes. Yeah, no, because um, um, what I like to call translation, that is drawing or just doing uh, things in relationship to um, an experience. And uh, drawing is something that implies making choices. So in art, when you, when you decide to use a, a um, so when you when you decide to use a, an instrument instead of another, so you decide to draw, um, that's already a choice, and it this it sort of um, it, it, it implies that you just forget about all the other choices. And also, when you decide to draw that particular shape, you've already um, discarded the other possibilities. Mm -hmm. So um, you kind of 
as you remember and you put down on a piece of paper something, you've discarded those possibilities, so you um, erase bits of information while mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. That's my, I don't know, my kind of understanding, which is probably when you recollect something, even through talking, um, you form, uh, uh, you give form to the memory in that moment, mm -hmm. um, and everything else stays there or goes somewhere else. Yeah. So that is the idea of erasure that I have, but probably you thought in terms of amnesia. It's really important for us to forget, isn't yeah. it? If we remembered everything, we'd be so overwhelmed by information that actually we wouldn't be able to remember anything. If you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Be, and that's actually one of the common... So you can think about forgetting in terms of just losing information in your brain, but actually the most common mechanism of forgetting is, is um, things interfering with each other. So in a sense, forgetting happens because you have too much information in your brain rather than not enough. And so, um, but this concept of erasure, the idea that you can forget the irrelevant details, for example, in a memory is very important. If you remembered every single detail of every one of your memories, your brain would just be completely overwhelmed.